It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. We've got a really important show for you today. We have uh, Greg Buccheroni, and we're calling him. He's in Philadelphia, and he's got a fascinating story about uh, what happened to him as a child and his connection to the Jerry Sandusky uh, scandal. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Buccheroni, are you there? Yes, I am. I got you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, tell us about yourself. Who is Greg Buccheroni? Well, who I am today is I work for the city of Philadelphia, uh, working with uh, youth violence prevention, uh, promoting neighborhood watch programs, and getting people involved in reporting quality of life uh, concerns via uh, the Philadelphia has a 311 program. Uh, so I do that for the city. I'm a community activist that advocates for victims of crime, and I work with at-risk kids trying to get them on the straight and narrow path and staying out of trouble. That's who I am today. Uh, who I was in the 70s and 80s, uh, pretty much in the 70s and early 80s, I was a poster child for juvenile delinquency, crime, and probably everything a kid shouldn't be doing. And, uh, but I evolved, I had good mentors, and I evolved into the person I am today, which is a law-abiding citizen. You're some kind of like a peace officer, right? Like an unarmed cop, right? Uh, no, not today, no. Okay. Today, uh, what I do is I work for the city. It's an anti-violence program, anti-crime program. Uh, I was a police officer uh, for a lot of years when I got out the Army, uh, but that's not really my cup of tea. Uh, I'm more of uh, advocating for victims of crime, working with troubled kids, and getting people to improve the quality of life in their neighborhoods and reduce crime and, and things of that nature. So I was more of an activist than I was a police officer. So, gotcha. uh, I mean, I've been there, done that. It's not really who I am. So uh, I'm more of a, someone who goes out there, works with the city. We do partner with law enforcement officials and, um, and you know, reducing crime and improving community safety. But I'm not a peace officer. So in the 70s and 80s, when you were like a wild kid, uh, I guess you were about like, from, that was like from 15 to 20, right? Uh, no, actually, I started to do crime probably at nine years old, nine or ten years old. Uh, and then things just escalated from there, and they kind of, uh, you know, took it until I got to the age of 18. And then by the time 18, you know, I saw that I was going down the path into a roadway state penitentiary and I was given an opportunity to turn my life around and go into the military, which I did. And when I got out of the military, uh, I came out with an honorable discharge and they expunged my juvenile record, which was pretty heavy okay. at the time. What kind of charges did you have as a juvenile? Uh, anything from, you know, uh, shoplifting all the way up to, you know, theft of auto, uh, violence, uh, you know, vandalism, uh, commercial burglaries, terroristic threats, you know, a variety of things. That's and so and so. What, what do you think? Associated with uh, organized crime. And, and what is it that makes you think that got you involved in that kind of life? Well, you know, when I was a kid, meaning pre-adolescent. You know, my dad was in my life, my mom, you know, we were kind of a middle-class family. And then at some point, you know, my dad divorced my mom and uh, I wind up, you know, my my mom had to work two jobs and my dad was, you know, paying child support, but it wasn't that much. So uh, my older sister had to babysit us and we struggled in poverty, well, welfare and everything from a single parent household. And uh, before I know it, uh, you know, there, there was other criminal types, juvenile and adult, that, uh, you know, said, look, you know, you kids can make some money this way. And uh, at first it was just doing petty crimes, um, petty uh, commercial burglaries, running numbers, uh, 
you know, committing petty thefts for organized crime, failure use, and running errands. And then as I, the more I got older, the, the, the kind of things escalated from there. Okay, so organized crime figures in the 70s and the 80s, uh, who are we talking about? Like uh, Little Nicky well, Scarfo? In Philadelphia, it all started... Well, in Philadelphia, what happened was the... Um, my my uncle Dan Butcheroni, who was a uh, ranked number four in the heavyweight division back in the fifties under Rocky Barciano, but the last name Butcheroni, his name was Dan Butcheroni. He was very popular with a lot of mobsters. So when people found out that my last name was Butcheroni, uh, at first there was a mob, two mobsters in Philadelphia. One's name was Harry Riccabini. And the other one was Angela Bruno, who were very friendly with my uncle. Uh, you know, back then in the 50s, I guess the, there was one heavyweight champion, and the mob ran the boxing game. And so anybody who was ranked as anybody in, in the boxing game, you know, you had to go through mobsters, and especially a guy that's Italian. Uh, you know, the, the, a lot of mobsters know each other, and, you know, that's how it worked. So they gave, they had me run in small errands. I was back in probably 1975, and I got myself in a variety of trouble that way. Truancy, uh, you know, uh, police banging on the door, bring me on for commercial uh, thefts, uh, commercial burglaries, uh, associate. You know, I got myself in a lot of trouble there. Okay, and, and what about drugs and alcohol? Is there a problem with that? Not at first, no. I, I mean, you know, we'd have a little sip of beer. Uh, keep, uh, probably 1975, I was probably 10 years old. So, uh, well, you know, they give you a uh, little beer here and there, nothing big. I didn't really smoke cigarettes at the time. I was just too little. But I would drink a little beer, trying to be cool, maybe pretend like I was smoking cigarettes, uh, trying to be cool with the other uh, kids with issues. And, and uh, But at, at that age, no. Uh, and then, but as 1975 goes into 1976, uh, what happened was the uh, Philadelphia has what's called a Department of Human Services, which is pretty much child protection. So it's a, like a child protection agency for the county. Sure. And uh, so I was, my mom, you know, the, uh, these workers, these child youth advocates or child, uh, child protection uh, advocates, for the city of Philadelphia were going up and um, for the most part just telling me, telling my mom that, you know, that, that I'm going to, I could be adjudicated to a placement center in Philadelphia because uh, I'm missing school, I'm hanging with the wrong crowd. I've been taken to the police station a lot, but my mom had to come pick me up and uh, they thought this was not the direction of a kid who should go. And in 1975, going into 1976, what happened was uh, that's when they uh, kind of put me into this program called the South Philadelphia Boys Club, which was uh, where I first started getting involved in human trafficking. Uh, this was like a, uh, South- a foster care, like a group home kind of situation? No, 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 no. It wasn't foster care at all. What it was is it was a program... Uh, for for the you know during the summertime and after school program okay. for average boys that were and uh, that you know came from broken households and were in and out of trouble and everything so it was uh, kind of a program for these average boys to stay out of trouble and uh, so that's what I got involved in with that right there and that was in 1975 going into 76 I think at the time I was probably 11 years old. Now, is this so, the kind of thing where it was like a community center in the neighborhood, or they took you on a bus and took you out to the to the like a? The... No, no, no. This was in the neighborhood. Okay. This was in in South Philadelphia. It was called the South Philadelphia Boys Club. I lived in South Philadelphia, and a lot of the troubled boys that were the equivalent of poster child for ju- poster children for juvenile delinquency right. were adjudicated, or you hey, go there, or your kid's going to be put into a placement center and taken away from your foster care. So this was an alternative to that, and uh, and that's when I was introduced to uh, two pedophiles. One was named Ed Savage, and the other one was named Sam Rappaport. And they were a multimillionaire, politically connected philanthropist 
that because uh, these these programs are all nonprofits. Right. So for nonprofits to succeed, you have to have money and people back in these nonprofits to take kids to trips and things of that nature. Uh, pay for you know food, trips, uh, staff, administrative costs. So philanthropy generates money to pay all these bills to take these kids out and give them a, a better experience. And unfortunately, in my case, two of the philanthropists that were involved in the South Philadelphia Boys Club, Boys Club were pedophiles. So these are like the two main guys financing the operation. But what about like uh, the, the, the the counselors and stuff like that? And it's, a lot of these places, they hire teenagers, too, and stuff like that. Were they also molesting the kids? Uh, no. They, they, a lot of the people there... Uh, when I first got involved, there was rumors. When I first started going there, there was rumors, you know, uh, that, you know, if you need some money or you need sneakers or something that, you know, this guy, we knew uh, Sam Rappaport, Sammy, or Sam, and then Ed Savage, we have all the kids knew him as Fast Eddie. Mm. And pretty much was, hey, you know, this guy's a little touchy-touchy, but if you're nice to him, he'll be nice to you and take you out and buy you stuff and let you party and get you out of trouble and uh, give you a few dollars and, you know, and then if you introduce them to some of your friends, uh, he'll kick you a couple dollars that way too. So uh, that that was kind of in the beginning. So this is like the word amongst the kids there. And it, did they come right out and say, hey, you have to like have sex with them when you had to fool around no. with them? No. No, they, they didn't come up and they didn't approach me at all at first. The other day, you know, this is uh, Mr. Savage, this is Mr. Rappaport and, these are, I didn't know what a philanthropist was, but that's how they were introduced to us. And that uh, they, you know, they donate money very generously towards the South Philly Boys Club so that we can have a better life. Uh, but then there was rumors because uh, then when, what happened was I'm a trouble kid and they're mixing you with other trouble kids. And so then I started smoking marijuana and drinking alcohol a little bit more heavier. And the kids, you know, kids talk. Yeah, and they were like, you know, the guy's a fag, this and that. So I was like, you know, so a couple times they invited me to parties. I said, now at the time I believe I'm 11 years old. So I said, look, I'm a street talk kid, and I am a general. At the time, I was a general practitioner of juvenile related crime. That's how I put because I, I, I mean, we committed crimes. We shoplifted. We stole cars. Now adults were helping us do this. We sold counterfeit food stamps. We, you know, we vandalized people's properties. They owed money to the mob for bookkeep, uh, for, you know, uh, loan sharking or gambling. Um, so we did a lot of things. But so when these guys came up and would tell me about all this other stuff, I was at first I was kind of, well, I'm not gay, so I'm not going to do that crap. And uh, so. They said, no, 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 no. It's, they don't think of it that way. And what happens in Vegas, they, they used other kids to approach us. They never approached us. Right. And so the other kids would kind of come up and say, look, there's going to be a party. And I said, yeah, but these guys are fags. I don't want to go there because I'm hearing rumors from other kids. And they said, no, no, everything's cool. Everything's cool. And I remembered the, the first incident, I believe it was 75 or 76. And when I go there, um, for the most part, it's a party in Northeast Philadelphia and there's a pool and we get there and there's weed and alcohol and they're sh having pornography and they got older girls that what my guess were stripper types hmm. and they're, you know, they're topless in the pool. And so we're, you know, eating food and drinking alcohol and watching porn and I'm being stimulated. And so my friends tell me, come on, let's go in the pool and get a skinny dip. Now, you know, 11 years old, I'm, I'm, I'm real nervous with a girl. So I, but I get in there because of peer pressure and I'm under the influence of porn and marijuana and alcohol. I get in there and then we're just kind of wrestling around and, and the girls are, you know, naked and we're naked. Then the, the um, these guys get in the pool with us and they get naked. Hmm. And then they start wrestling with us. And, I, you know, even though I was under the influence of alcohol and marijuana, I knew that, you know, this is not a natural act. And I was a little nervous. So I told the kids, look, man, these fags are in the pool. They're kind of rubbing their penis against us and all. And they're like, no, 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 it's all cool, man. They're just horse playing. It's just rest, wrestling. 
I said, yeah, but the, the guy's got like a boner and he, he's rubbing it against me and I feel uncomfortable. They said, no, 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 just be cool, man. Don't be a party pooper. So we kind of wrestled and then afterwards, I, you know, th- that was pretty much it. They were just kind of bumping and grinding on us, even though they used the word horseplay, but that's how I perceived it as you're bumping and grinding on me. Right. Because that's what we did to girls in the pool. When we were kids and girls were in the pool with us, we bumped and grind on us, but that's what these guys were doing to us. So um, uh, afterwards, I kind of felt a little dirty. I said, hey, you know what? I don't want to go back to any of these parties because I kind of feel like the dude did some fag shit to me. And they're like, no, 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 it's cool. And then the one guy, Fast Eddie, Eddie Savage, kind of gave me 60 bucks. He said, oh, man, don't make it, you know, hit 60 bucks. Go, you know, go buy yourself some sneakers and have a good time. And uh, so I said, oh, I'll never do that stuff again. But, you know, what happens is uh, you're poor, you're living in poverty, and all these kids are going to places and getting sneakers and partying, getting nice clothes. So I decided to do it again. And then one time turned into two times, they wind up turning into hundreds of times. And that's how I started in this now the, the kids knew and, and these two guys uh, Eddie and uh, Sam they knew but what about the other administrators at the, at the boys at the youth center were they involved too did they know what was going on mm-hmm. I can't tell you what they knew or didn't know okay uh, I know that they were not involved in any of these all like when we were at the sites doing official things for with the South Philly Boys Club None of that was going on. Right. It's when they say, well, listen, you know, like they would take us down to Washington, D.C. for a trip to see, you know, official monuments and stuff like that. Nothing happened. Times they would take us to Great Adventure. Nothing happened to Great Adventure. They'd take you to New York to, you know, go see a play. Nothing would happen. But then afterwards, they say, look, we're going to go, you know, we're going to go stay at, the, at Wildwood or Atlantic City, or we're going to go to New York, or you know, we're going to go to Washington, D.C., or we're going to go to a Penn State football game, and then afterwards, any kid wants to stay can hang around, and then there's going to be like a little after party. But this usually involved Eddie Savitz and his friends, and a lot of the staff did not stay for any of that. They kind of just like kids would you know, get on the little – Kind of, it was kind of like one of those vans that's a, a bus van. Sure. And they would get on there, and then Eddie Savage said, well, we'll, we'll take them home, you know. Uh, I'm going to go take the kids to get ice cream. But really, we didn't go get ice cream. We went somewhere because at a lot of these events, they kind of introduced to the people that were their friends. And then after, so everything, you know, nothing's being done. Hey, this is the so-and-so, and I told you about this kid. And now, like I tell people today, you know, Today, I'm kind of old guy like Al Bundy from Marriage with Children. But back in the 70s and early 80s, I was Vinnie Barbarino from Welcome Back, Cotter. And, you know, I had the looks, the youth, the pizzazz. Uh, I did resemble a lot, very similar to John Travolta's role as Vinnie Barbarino with my hairstyle and my swag and my looks. So, uh, you know, a lot of these guys went to that Vinnie Barbarino character and so pretty much guys, you know, they they had a certain taste for a certain type of kid. And uh, and they shared pictures. And then when they came from out of town or we went to somewhere where they were, meaning and we left Philadelphia to go to State College or D.C. or New York or Atlantic City or Wildwood, New Jersey or wherever we went, you know, they would introduce you to their friends. And then the rule of thumb was, be nice to my friend and I'll be nice to you. Mm. And you'll have a good time and leave with a couple of dollars in your pocket. Now, initially, keep in mind, I was not gay, but I was a, a juvenile criminal that was criminally minded. So what we went out there, we wanted to go out and still make money because we grew up in poverty in a broken household. So my goal was to make money without the cops getting involved. And once you got past the gay, no gay... Uh, it became like an ATM machine with no credit li- limit. So, you know, that's where the alcohol and drugs started getting more intense because it's not a natural act for 11, 12, and 13-year-old boy to go out there and engage in sexual deviant acts with an adult male. 
with an adult female, I still would have been nervous, but it would have at least been a more natural act. But with an adult male, it's, I'm not gay, so this is not a natural act for me. So that's where the you know they start giving you downers and and and, and giving you like antidepressants, and then while you're kind of delusional, you're out there making money. And then the more you did it, the dirtier you felt. And then the more drugs you did, right. to kind of try to kill that dirtiness feeling that you that you felt for doing such things. Now, what about did you ever confide in your brothers and your sisters or your, or your mother? No, absolutely not. Because that was not. Keep in mind, seventies yeah. and eighties. If, if you grew up in a tough inner city neighborhood, whether it was New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, wherever. And you came from the streets, and you you got a reputation of being kind of a street tough kid that commits crime and hangs with adult criminals. And they found out you were doing that, you were considered a fag. And considered a fag on the street in the neighborhood that's not forgiven for regular street tough guys. It, it would have been like the vultures coming in and wolves attacking the prey because they would have seen that as a sign of weakness. So I kept it to myself. There was rumors going out there that my, my brother or my uncle would find out and I would deny it. I blame it on the other kids. And I would tell them, look, I ain't no fag. I, I, I stopped at a party, the fag was there, this guy was there, but it was they were doing stuff. It wasn't me, I just happened to be there. Yeah, yeah I of understand. Course, what, I was yeah. doing it. I'm 55 years old, so I know the time period you're talking about, and I grew up in the Bronx, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Now, uh, but, but your uncles and stuff like that, they did notice a change in you. They said, hey, something's wrong with my nephew. Well, here's the thing. They knew that I was hanging with adult criminal types and and juvenile delinquent types. Right. They they knew all this. So it's not a shocker that as I get older, hanging with these adult criminal types, because the adult criminal types wasn't just organized crime figures. Like at first it started out with guys in Philly, then it wind up with guys in Jersey and New York. Right. But but these these they they knew that I was hanging around with people I shouldn't have been hanging around, juveniles and adults, because it was like drug dealers and there was dirty cops and there was, uh, you know, guys involved in motorcycle gangs. So my thing is that any type of way I can make money, I'm going to make money. And, and I remember that uh, one of the New York mobsters that I associated with was an individual named Jimmy Burke. And... Do you probably remember Jimmy Burke from the movie Goodfellas portrayed by Robert De Niro? And he was an Irish gangster associated with the Lucchese crime family. You were you were from the Bronx, right? Yeah. So he was out of Queens, but he kind of ran different vices at different areas of New York. And uh, you know, and here's a guy that if they if he needed I remember the couple times that I would travel to Queens uh, one of the scams he had was uh, the coupon fraud. And the other thing was if people owed money, a coupon fraud pretty much is the, the Sunday papers have the coupons in the, in the center okay. for the Sunday papers, and they had the delivery boys, and, the, and they used to have the honor system. So on, on, they would drop off like 500 papers for a Sunday, uh, the, the newspaper boy to go pick up and deliver it throughout the neighborhood. So these guys, the union... The union uh, newspaper guys that were delivering this owed money for a loan shark and a gambling debts. So what they did is they told Jimmy Burke and, and Henry Hill and the rest of them that we're going to, you know, these are where we're dropping them off and what time we're dropping them off. And then we'd follow with a, a U-Haul truck, an old U-Haul truck. And then as they dumped them off, we loaded them up. And then we took them to a, a, a isolated area, threw the papers out, and kept the, the, the coupon sections of the Sunday paper. And we got like, I think at the time we got 20, 25 cent a paper. And uh, I never knew what they did with that, but they wanted the coupons and uh, money's money. And this is one of the avenues we did to make money. And it turned out later on in the eighties, when I came out off active duty in the army, there was a mob trial in New York and they talked about coupon fraud. And here the coupon fraud is, uh, you know, all these things you go to a supermarket or corner grocery store to get a store credit on some merchandise. And here they, they, they were making millions of dollars a year off this. Who knew who, who to figure that out? And like Jimmy Burke, another thing, he, if someone owed him money, he'd tell us to go into the house and break in the house and steal their animal, usually a dog or a cat, depending mm -hmm. on 
and and, and we were like, well, I, I was a pet lover, so I kind of felt uncomfortable. My money was money, and the reason I said, well, why don't we just beat the hell out of the guy that owes you the money? He says, nah, because the guy ain't gonna pay. I said, well, let's go threaten his family. They said, nah. Have you, sometimes people love the pets more than they love their old ladies. So you go out and kidnap the dog, and and then and I could. Believe it or not, people love their animals more than they love. So if you threaten the guy's wife, the guy owed you money for bulk making and loan charging, and you threaten his old lady, you threaten him, you know, maybe he pays you, maybe he doesn't. But if he loves his dog and you keep that the dog and, and Jimmy's going to cut the dog's head off or send the dog back to him in pieces, the guy would come out and find money. It's, it's funny, but, you know, that's the way Jimmy Burke was. You know, it's you funny know, you mentioned mob- that. Because when I was on Staten Island, I remember we had this guy. Because uh, I moved from the Bronx to Staten Island, and it, this guy owed money to ga- for gambling. And first they broke his leg, right? And you know we see him walk with the the crutches, you know, with the broken leg with the cast. And then like a week sure. later, they, they broke his arm. But then they, they couldn't break it. You know, yeah. they ran out of stuff to break on the guy. <laughs> there was nothing left to go after, you know. So they, you know, and he wasn't paying the money. So what are you going to do now? Uh, well, this is where they were. The guy was an animal lover. We go <laughs> right into his backyard or break into his house and steal his animal. Right, right. And this was just another avenue. But these are some of the crimes I was involved in. Uh, but the, this draws the attention of the police department, where hanging with Eddie Savage and Sam Rappaport and some of these other guys as things evolved did not bring the attention of the police department. So we made a lot of money without worrying about the cops looking for us. So it just became, once you got past the gay, no gay, it became a, a way to make for runaway kids or trouble kids that come from poverty to make a, a party lifestyle and make as much money as you want. You could get, If you wanted to go out seven days a week, 24 hours a day, you could. And what I say, I, I call it the ATM uh, syndrome, meaning you could go out and get 20, between 20 and and $100 each time you did it. And then when you blow that, you just go back out and hit it again. And yeah. when you blow that money, you go back out and do it again. And uh, so you're from New York. Atlantic City in, in the late 70s, uh, the casinos come in. And the first casino was resorts. And I remember that was, I believe, 78. And um, so Eddie Savitz or Fast Eddie, you know, he says, uh, look, uh, you kids want to go down to casinos and, and I'll put you up in one of these motels on the Black Horse Pike. So we're like, yeah, 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 you know, you're going to put us up and give us money and we can party and then you're going to tell my mom because that this is all through the South Philly Boys Club. So whatever this guy said, my mom thought was in my best interest. So they said, look, we're going to take him for the summer and keep him out. And my mom was stressed out because we were all kind of kids with challenges in the household. Some of us had more challenges than others. Right. So my mom saw this as an opportunity to give her a break. My mom was trying to, you know, date men, and, and we were in the way. So my mom did not know that, you know, all this stuff was going on. But, you know, she thought it was in, for my best interest. So, we, you know, we go to Atlantic City, and I remember the security used to sneak us up the um, – the service elevators, and they had high rollers coming in Atlantic City that had a, 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 a deviant taste for underage boys or underage girls, or sometimes both. Hmm. So we we kind of you know did what we did, and that became another avenue of making money. And, and then how did the child porn get get uh, come about? The pornography. Well, Sam Rappaport, um, well Eddie Savage, and a lot of these guys like to take pictures. Uh, of their deviant activities with the different boys. So they, they, they were involved in taking pictures, and, and, and at the time they were using um, uh, a kind of a, a film thing, but it was either, I, I, it was like that 8 millimeter or 16 millimeter film. Gotcha. So Sam Rappaport was a real estate tycoon, tycoon in Philadelphia, and Eddie Savage and him would go to this place called the Apollo at 13th and Market. And it was one of these Gambino-fronted pornography establishments that was run by a guy named Robert D. Bernardo. We knew him as D.B. And Richie Bassiano. Uh, you may remember Richie Bassiano was always dubbed the king of porn in New York in Times Square. So 
what happened was these guys liked it. They, they cherished these film, these pictures, mm. high quality pictures or film. And so Sam Rappaport owned the real estate business, the buildings that these Gambino pornography establishments in Times Square, Atlantic City, or Philadelphia were located in. It was kind of a, a collaboration of criminal minds. And so they took pictures and then they would go to this porno place because they couldn't go to a legitimate mom and pop location because as you're developing this film, you're going to see what's on it. And, you know, maybe you go to the cops, maybe you don't. But when you go to these Gambino fronted pornography establishments, uh, no one's going to go to the cops. You know, they, they, you pay whatever it is and they'll produce it, duplicate it, whatever. And that's, that's how they got involved in porn. But they cherished this porn. And then they would share it like baseball cards. Hmm. And, and you would see them doing this, so trading them back and forth? Well, no, at certain events that I was at, what they would do is say, for instance, I'll give you for instance, um, Penn State football game. No, it was, uh, we would go there in 1978. They introduced me to this guy, Scott. And Scott's from out of town. He's moving to the Philadelphia area. He's from out of town. Uh, but he's at a, I meet him at a Penn State football game. So the game's legitimate, but it's, it's, too, it's kind of like a, a deviant meet and greet. Nothing happens at the game, but you're there. I'm going to introduce you to my friend. Then we're going to go back to Philadelphia and have a good time afterwards. So we go, I go to a football game, and the guy wants to see, when we get there, you know, to talk and meet me and this and that, and then I see Eddie Savage and Jerry Sandusky, even though I didn't know he was Jerry Sandusky at the time. I heard a lot about this coach, Jerry, but I never put the face to the name till later on. Okay. And so he's there. Eddie Savage is there. Richie Bilstein's there. And this guy, Scott, later on uh, turned out to be Lawrence Scott Ward, who was a professor with the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. But the, I didn't know that. We just A lot of times when they introduce you to them, they don't tell you their name and what they are. They either tell you nicknames or or or... or the first name, so they don't really get into the person's, you know, this is who he is and giving their bio on each one. So when I get there, they're sharing pictures because he wants to see what he gets. Uh, you know, so they showed pictures there. Uh, in 1979, I go to a second mile charity fundraiser in State College, and uh, they're, they have pictures. What they did is they did a lot of times with Shane Dusky, uh, he was involved but what we known is what we refer to on the street as a kids as kid swapping, which is very similar to wife swapping. But instead of women, you're swapping kids. Meaning, if I come up to your event or you come to my event in my town or I go to your town at your event, I'm bringing one or two kids and you got two, one or two kids and then you show me like pictures like, you kind of like, you know, I'm showing you what these kids look like naked. And then, you know, you swap them like you would do, like, you know how guys swap baseball cards? Sure. You swap them. These guys cherish these these pictures. And then, you know, they introduce you, and then after whatever event, you know, you went somewhere else and you did the DVD that. So, and Sandusky was involved in, in three of those incidents, uh, specifically in 1978, even though I did not know who he was at the time. Later on, I've heard a lot about this coach, Jerry this, coach Jerry that, but I never was formally introduced to him until 1979. And even then, I didn't want to believe it because the guy I heard, you know, from what I, the way they was coach Jerry, they said, made him sound like you know, a little weaselly looking fag. And then it, when I meet him at first, it's like, you know, he doesn't look like a weaselly fag. <clears throat> but later on <clears throat> in 1979, when I'm formally introduced to him, his true colors come out, you know, as time progresses at this event at the Second Mile Charity. Uh, where he's getting touchy-touchy and they're sharing pictures of kids. And then I said, you know, this guy is a fag, even though he doesn't look like a fag. And keep in mind, when I say fag, uh, we thought these pedophiles must have been gay at the time. And so if you were a guy in, involved in, in a pedophile, you must be gay. Because this is, you know, the... the no, no one really knew if you were having sex with a man, you had to be gay, whether the man was a boy. Later on, you educate your mind and you find out that being gay and being a pedophile is two separate things. But when you're young in the 70s and early 80s 
in the mindset of street dog kids, it's all the same. Mindset of America, it's all the same back then. Yeah, let me, let me ask you a couple of questions. These guys, Savage, uh, Rappaport, and Goldstein, were any of them ever arrested or charged with anything like this? Savage. It wasn't Savage. It was Savage. Uh, S-A-V-I-T-Z. Gotcha. Uh, uh, Rappaport was never arrested. Keep in mind, these guys are politically connected. Sure. Uh, so, But Eddie Savage was arrested several times, but nothing ever happened. They kept giving him probation. And then the last time he gets arrested is in 1992 <clears throat> but by this time he's got six months to live and he's dying of AIDS hmm. so he dies before his trial he gets, so what happens is it never goes to trial because he's dying of AIDS so he dies before he goes to trial so he never went he was arrested and he was arrested I think two or three times over a several year period but nothing ever happened because he's friends with politically connected people. And, and his charges were like These child guys, prostitution charges? No, they were corrupting the morals of a minor okay. and, a, you know, stuff like that. They did not, keep in mind, underage boys involved in straight hustling. This is what we called it. We didn't call it prostitution. We called it straight hustling. Uh, I would go see certain friends. I'd look, I'm going to go out and hustle a few dollars. I'll be back. We're talking straight hustling. And when the cops got involved, which was seldom because we were considered throwaway kids. So the cops really didn't care. But if they did get involved because of whatever reason, the offend the, the adult offender would be charged with more of a child molesting case versus a human trafficking, meaning prostitution. Right. They just the law enforcement back then was not educated in in human trafficking or underage boys involved in prostitution, they saw that as all gay behavior. And keep in mind, law enforcement was behind, the, you know, they just dropped the ball a lot of times because they didn't, the word human trafficking never came up. And if you're a kid going walking around, if you're a boy that's in and out of trouble anyway, and you're doing this, you must be gay. And this is a gay thing. So, you know, they never charged you with that. If they brought us in, they brought us in for curfew or disorderly conduct or obstructing the highway. But they never charged us with any prostitute-related crimes. And if they decided to charge anyone, which they never did, but if they chose to do that, they would charge them with molesting kid versus human trafficking a child. Gotcha. Now, um, did you actually have a physical contact with Sandusky? Uh, there was two separate times, one in 1979 and one time, 70, I mean 1980. And these were both during a second mile charity fundraiser in State College. And what I'll say is I was brought up there both times to sexually engage him afterwards at some local motel and, but it never just, it never happened. Because the first time I go up there, St. Dusky schmoozing people to donate money towards his charity. So Eddie Savage was a uh, fast Eddie, as we know him, was if he said, look, we're going to do this at five and be done by six because I got to head back to Philadelphia to run my company. He was very particular on the times gotcha. that he had to do it. Uh, where Sa uh, where St. Dusky was more schmoozing. And so when it got past five o'clock and, and St. Dusky was schmoozing other people, uh, the, the DVD X meaning, um, kind of oral sex and, uh, wrestling naked in the bed in the local motel never happened. But what did happen was he, uh, they brought me up there with the understanding this is going to happen. Uh, they brought me from New Jersey at the time I was living in Blackwood, New Jersey. And, um, so they brought me to state college and then he kind of groped me. He uh, shared new photos. He sexually solicited me, uh, but that's all he did. Then the second time in 1980, when I go up there, uh, this is the rain check for the 1979. He wanted a rain check. So in 1980, he bring me back at a separate second mile charity fundraiser. And <clears throat> when I go the second time, I had not bathed in a couple of days. Now, Eddie Savitz liked the dirtier you were, the more money you paid. So if you were out there rolling around in the mud and you didn't take a bath in a couple of days, Eddie Savage loved that. But Sandusky didn't like that. He was more of a cleansing this guy. 
So when I go there, I had not brushed my teeth in two days. I'd been drinking alcohol and eating food. So I then I had taken a bath in, in days. And so when I go there, my personal hygiene, Sandusky had a problem with my personal hygiene. And he wanted me to kind of um, stay for a couple of days, and he was going to let me go to his house and take a shower. And But Eddie Savage, if I go with him, I was one of his favorites at the time. So this kid swapping means, hey, I go there, we do whatever, and then afterwards the kid goes back home with me. He doesn't stay with you. Uh, but Shane Dusky wanted me to stay because he had a problem with my personal hygiene, which was pretty dirty at the time. Uh, so when that doesn't wasn't I wasn't Eddie Savage wasn't going to let me go and spend a couple of days at Shane Dusky's home. Uh, Shane Dusky was just turned off by me because of my body odor at the time and uh, my personal hygiene issues. So you you never went to Sandusky's home. No, no. Did, did you ever see or meet Sandusky's wife or his sons? No, not that I, I can't tell you if I did. I was never formally introduced to any of them. They could have been there, but I don't know because I was no one ever formally introduced me as this is his wife or these are his children. So the answer would probably be, the best of my knowledge, no. Now, did you ever did you know any other boys that did go with Sandusky? Uh, yeah. And, and you, uh, one of the kids that came up from Philadelphia, but later on he committed suicide. Okay. And then when uh, the charges came up against Sandusky, did you offer to testify and, and, and send your story forward to whoever was well, first what happened was I was told Eddie Savage, me, me and him stayed in contact all the way until the time he was arrested, 92. Okay. Uh, for some reason, I felt sorry for the guy, and I felt it was my fault and not his, and that him giving me money and introduce you guys was my boy, my fault, not his. Uh, so me and him stayed in contact with each other, even though I probably shouldn't have. Uh, they say that's that, uh, that syndrome. Right. I forget what they call it, Stockholm syndrome. Right. But me and him stayed in contact. He never molested me after 1980 anymore because I kind of went in a different direction after 1980. But me and him stayed as friends, and we had mutual friends. And the... Uh, uh, I never got as far as that. What was the question? It clearly, so I answered it. For, yeah, that, correctly. that if you ever offered to testify against Sandusky in 2011, when the case came, Eddie Savage told me that Sandusky died of cancer back in the late 80s. Okay. So I, you know, I didn't pursue him because I kind of buried that life and moved forward in my own life, and I did. Though I didn't, I was ashamed of that, so I buried it. So in 2011. Um, you know, I'm at this local restaurant, and, and it goes Penn State and St. Dusky. Now, St. Dusky is much older now. And I looked, I said, son of a bitch. That son of a bitch is still alive. They, they told me he died of cancer. So he's still alive. So I went through all kinds of behavior things because now, it you know, it kind of um, opened up an old wound that never healed. And so I didn't know what to do because who would believe you? And then how do you go out and talk about this stuff? Because now, you know, well, I moved on and like people didn't know about it. A lot of people didn't know about my past, including my family. And I have children. So I'm like, I want to do something. I don't want to do nothing because I don't want people to know my past. Uh, and then if I do it, I'm, I'm going to have to talk. So at the time, I'm going through all kinds of emotional turmoil. And the only agency in Philadelphia at the time that could help me was a place called Women Organize Against Rape. And I can tell you this, the hardest thing for a street tough guy to do is to, to, is to admit to a bunch of women or anybody that they were a victim of rape from another male. Because it's just street, guys, street tough guys don't talk about that. Sure. That's a sign of weakness. So uh, I went to this women organized against rape several times, but I turned away because rape is a strong word because no guy wants to admit that he was raped by another guy. You know, so I went there, then I cowered out, then I went there, and then I was going through emotional turmoil, and I said, I got to do something because I'm, I'm losing control, and I'm thinking of killing someone. So I eventually get the courage and go in, and they start talking to me, and then, you know, I'm kind of opening up a big wound that, that, that is very painful emotionally to talk about. And then at some point, 
I reach out to law enforcement and, um, you know, and they interviewed me several times and, uh, I tell them, but they kept telling me statute of limitations. So, and then ironically, I, I, at the time I was, uh, volunteering as a part-time employee with the Philadelphia district attorney's office. So Joe McGettigan, who I did know with the Philadelphia district attorney's office, he left the district attorney's office and went to work for the Pennsylvania attorney general's office. So I reached out to him because I heard that he was the prosecutor. Me and him knew each other through the Philadelphia district attorney's office. So I reached out to him and me have a, we have a conversation on the phone and I tell him what happened. And so he tells me, he says, well, I can't use you. If you tell me you out there doing all this, the statute of limitations, I can't use you. And he says, but if you told me a story that Sandusky molested you on Penn State campus and Joe Paterno knew about it, and when he said molesting, he means more than just groping you right. or, or coercing with you or grooming you. Uh, he actually performed either oral or some type of sexual contact at that level. And uh, it happened on Penn State campus, and Joe, somehow you believe Joe Paterno knew about it, then we'll use you during the trial. And then after the trial, there'll be a lot of civil attorneys very interested in you and representing you if you get where I'm going. So I said, well, he never did any of that, and none of that happened on Penn State campus. And as far as I know, Joe Paterno doesn't know, know anything from it. So he tells me again, he says, listen, I, I can't use you for what you're saying because there's statute of limitations, but I can use you for the trial with him and a guy named Frank Trina, who was the second prosecutor. And they got me on a conference call. I'm calling them from Philadelphia and they're in state college working for the Pennsylvania Attorney General's office. And Joe McGettigan says again, hey, you know, if you tell me, if you tell me in your story that you're gonna make allegations that Sandusky molested you and, and, and oral sex or something to that nature on Penn State campus and Joe Paterno knew I'll use you during the trial. And when I told him, listen, that's a lot, I'd be lying to you. So Joe, uh, uh, Joe McGettigan, the prosecutor got frustrated and he told me, well, look, I can't help you, you know, sorry that happened to you. And he cut the conversation short. And that was that. A couple questions for you. Now, you, you had never told anyone about these childhood traumas uh, until you heard, you, know, you saw on TV Sandusky, right? And then you started talking about it? Well, some of the other kids, see, we had a rule of thumb. What happened in Vegas stays in Vegas. So a lot of the kids that I did this stuff with, we all knew, but we didn't talk about it. Okay. It was considered unmanly to talk about that stuff. So you just kind of say, well, you know what? I ain't going to talk about this stuff no more. It happened. Let's get past it and man up because we're, we're not fags. So we kind of buried it. And then, you know, after 1980, I distanced myself from a lot of these kids who now then later on became young adults and addicted to drugs and alcohol and, you know, other things. So I, I kind of, as I was changing my life, I stayed away from these negative influences that knew about it. And then as far as my new friends, I didn't talk about that because right. that would mean you're gay. If you did that stuff, that's disgusting, and you got to be gay, and you're disgusting because they, my new friends, wouldn't have understood that. So I didn't. I just kept it. What happened in Vegas stays in Vegas. I kept it to myself in shame. But the thing is, you never actually had any sexual contact with Sandusky. It was just like a, a potentially, right? What was it that the trauma? Well, yeah. Kind of the grope in me was kind of no, like sure. coming to fill me up and going up my thigh to see where my penis. No, no, is no, no, no my I'm, I'm not going to go for that you either. Know, I know what you're saying. All, yeah, you know, all that's kind of a sexual offenses, and look at him looking at pictures, new pictures of me, and then right. kind of coercing me and all that. But but no, did I have like? let's say, oral sex or, or anal sex with him, no. See, but my question is, then, then why was it when you were in the diner there or the restaurant and you saw him on TV, why, did, why was that so, so pivotal? Why was that so uh, 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 such a movement, movement, you know what I mean, so important that you decided, well, I got to tell everybody. I'll tell you why. Yeah. In 1978, Lawrence Scott Ward, we knew him as Scott, that was an incident where I didn't know what, Sandusky looked at uh, at the time. I couldn't put the face to the name. Right. 
1978, when Eddie Savage takes me to a Penn State football game, uh, they introduced me to an out-of-town guest that's moving to the Philadelphia area named Scott. That to, later on turns out to be Lawrence Scott Ward from the University of Pennsylvania. But I get later on, the guy wants to have anal sex, and I said, absolutely not, I don't do that. I'll do all the things, but I won't do that. So that 1978 thing, as I go back to Philadelphia, and I say, I we go to this uh, this a motel, a hotel that Sam Rapport owned in the Gablehood section of Philadelphia called the Parker Spruce Hotel. And this was at 13th and Spruce. So I get there and this guy wants to keep having anal sex and I avoid him because I don't want to do that. I don't do that. So what he does is he drugs me. He somehow gets some kid to slip me something. I pass out. And in 1978, the guy raped me. And I wake up in in a different room with rectal trauma. That's all I'm going to tell you. Right. So that's why you were so traumatized then, when you saw Sandusky on TV. And then then he did it again in 1978, again. Right. And that kicked off the trauma because later on, the guy that was standing there, that was sharing and looking at these new photos, was Jerry Sandusky was with him. I didn't know that that was Sandusky at the time. I got you. Later in 79, I, I, I get, this is... Then I put one and one together. This is the guy that was there. And that was very traumatizing and very upset emotionally for me. And when I and then but they told me that Scott Ward got locked up in the nineties, so he's he was serving a life prison. And they told me Richie Bilstein died of cancer, Eddie Savage died of age, and the only other person that was left there at that time was that was in the introduction sharing nude photos of me was Jerry Sandusky. He's the last one uh, that is still alive and still in general pop population, meaning on the street. Now, when uh, when you... Uh, so that was very emotional for me, and that kind of put me into emotional turmoil. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense now, okay? Now I understand. Now, since you've come forward and you've been public with this story, have you heard from anybody else that's involved in this whole scene? Maybe old friends of yours or other uh, uh, victimizers or anything like that? Some of these strippers in the pool? Anybody else come forward? Well, the strippers in the pool, we didn't know who they were. They were just strippers at the... Right. They were these go-go girls that danced at these porno places owned by Richie Bassiano. So... But I mean, and, uh, now that so you've come forward, we, have any they, of them? We didn't know there? them. No, no, no. But now, since your story is so public, have any of them contacted you and say, "Hey, I remember this kid in the pool. I was one of the strippers." There was other kids that yeah. were involved with me, right? That, and I reached out to them, and or they reached out to me, and they were terrified that I was going to mention their name gotcha. publicly. Gotcha. So they 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 didn't come to support me. They came to say, "Keep their name out. Keep." And this is the exact words they say. Don't mention my fucking name. Keep my name out of your fucking mouth. If you want to tell everyone you were a fag, you go tell them. But don't fucking tell, mention my fucking name okay, right. and, or something to that effect. We got to use this on the so, air, so watch the language. But now, one more question, too, now. now. Now that Sandusky's in prison now, have you tried to contact him? Because he's so sloppy and stuff like that. When you hear these interviews, they actually asked him one time if you, if you liked, if he was sexually attracted to young boys, and he was sitting there, you know, thinking it over. Have you tried to contact him and maybe uh, get him to say something, admit something? Uh, I reached out to his attorney. Okay. And, uh, the, and But apparently the attorney don't want nothing to do with that. I see me. I got to be careful because I start acting out emotionally. So I try to, you know, uh, to me, let's just say that I don't want to. What am I going to say to the guy that I want to kill you? Yeah. You know, you ruined my life. You know, you, you, my friend committed suicide. You know, what am I going to say to you? You you. caused my friend's death. So, you know, I reached out to his attorney and, uh, but the attorney Looks like they, 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 Sandusky didn't want to talk to me, and I don't really want to talk. I mean, what am I going to say to the guy that you know? If you're on the street, I'm going to tell you. Yeah, I got you. Now, well, let me ask you a question. You know, so I got to be careful. We only got a few minutes left. Uh, what do you What do you want to leave us with? Well, it, it, I what I'm doing now is raising awareness to, mm-hmm. you know, how these guys get together with these. Nonprofit agencies for those who be looking out for kids and how they get street top boys to get involved in sex trafficking, especially street top boys. So I try to raise awareness of this is a problem in America. Uh, it's a problem internationally. 
and it's and, and they and a lot of kids, you know, a lot of people say, well, how can street talk boys be involved in this type of stuff? They're not gay and they're street talk. How could they allow a guy to do these things? And and, and bottom line, it comes up to dollars and cents. And when you're a kid and you're living in poverty and you don't know if you you know you haven't had a hot meal or you got scroungy clothes, sometimes it becomes a method of survival. So what I do is we try to erase awareness of how runaway boys or troubled boys get involved in human trafficking. So, and, because a lot of people like, because the Sandusky victims, they during the trial, so many of them did not tell the entire truth. They said, oh, he molested me, did that. But a lot of these kids knew that, hey, you, you hang with this guy, he'll give you some money, let you party, right. give you special gifts and privileges. So I try to raise awareness to parents and other law enforcement officials and child advocates on the reality of how these guys get these runaway kids, especially underage boys, to become involved in prostitution or better not yet known as human trafficking. And uh, Craig, if someone wants to get a hold of you, they want to talk to you, do you have a website or something like that? Now you can reach me out on Facebook. I'm on Greg Butcheroni on Facebook, Greg Butcheroni on Twitter. Greg, thank you so much, my friend. I really appreciate this. If anything new comes up, get a hold of me. We'll put you right on the air, okay? I got you, guy. You take care. Thank you. Okay, they got sure. Greg Butcheroni, man. The fascinating story. I tell you, and it was, I got a ring of truth there, man. Uh, the only thing I was concerned about is when he said that suddenly he was all upset in that diner when he heard this thing, and then he explained that. So I got to tell you something. I'm really impressed with this guy's story, Greg Butcheroni. You can find him on Facebook, B U C C E R O N I, Greg Butcheroni. If you have trouble finding him, get a hold of me, and I'll put you in contact with him.